election, but to pray for our nation now. Lord, it's not, not so much people my age and, and others that are here in the Lord, but it's for our children and our grandchildren. Lord, that they may experience all the blessings of freedom and life and to be able to preach the Word of God without criticism and that the Word of God would touch others' lives and include this nation, Father. That's our prayer. And Lord, I pray that if there's one person, even now, here in this sanctuary or online, that has never received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I pray that they would not wait until the invitation at the end of the message. Because you say, we don't know when you're about to come. So Father, this is your hour. This is your time. We are your people. We humbly bow before you. And some are crying for help, and some are crying for peace, which passes all understanding. Some are crying for their financial situation, for their children, their families, their husband, their wife, whatever it may be, Lord. Thank you that you do hear, and you promise that you will hear from heaven, and you will respond. And if it's not in the way that we desire, Lord, you say in, Revel in, in Romans that it will be for your glory and it will be for our very best. Oh, God, let us not miss this opportunity to receive what it is that you want to give to us and take from us and how to use us in this life. And I pray all of these things in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. Thank you. God bless you. I want uh, to encourage you, if you have your Bibles within, and, and maybe you can take that outline out that's, uh, uh, that's in your bulletin, I want you to turn to Joshua, Joshua chapter 3. And I want to speak to you about a message that, that I have titled, At the Brink of a God-Sized Future. At the Brink of a God-Sized Future. In Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 8, or chapter 6, verse 18 and 19, made this statement that, that I pray is underlined in your Bible, and more than that, that it's in your heart. But God said to the writer of Hebrews, hope is set before us. Hope is set before us. This hope, he says, is sure and it's steadfast. It is an anchor for the soul. When God says something like that, it's a promise. He cannot. He cannot deny that promise. He cannot deny the hope. Many of us are here today, and we're standing on the brink of hope, whatever that hope may be that you need. Pat and I stand on the brink of hope at knowing that this isn't the end. But the fields are ripe for harvest and the worshipers are few and the workers are few. My hope is for this precious family. And so I know that God will bless us as long as we are obedient to him. Brother Ray from Bay Area Baptist Church called me not long ago, sent me an email actually, and uh, he said, hey, I want to do one of your favorite songs. And I said, well, that's wonderful, Ray. Let me think about that, and I'll get back to you. And uh, 30 years ago, 30 years ago, while I was in seminary, I was a, serving on the staff, um, unpaid, as most seminary students are, just volunteering to, to learn, to, to become a pastor and a preacher and whatever. And one day my senior pastor, Frankie Rainey, wonderful, wonderful Christian man, said, hey, I want you to preach next Sunday. And I looked at him, I said, yes, sir. And inside I was saying, who, me? And I wasn't scared because there were five or six or 700 people there in the church. I was scared because Frankie Rainey, my senior pastor, was also the Greek professor in the seminary. So I just knew that he was going to analyze my message. 
he was going to see how I expository, or my expository techniques that I bring out in the passage what God intended to bring out in the passage. And I can't tell you how many times I rehearsed that message. And there was a man in our choir, much like Ray, and I said, the anchor holds had just come out. It was one of the more popular songs, and really, I mean, you know, you, you got to have a heart of stone if, if the anchor holds doesn't speak to you. And so I said, hey, would you sing this as a special before I, I preach? And he said, sure, I would be happy to do that. And he did. Thirty years later, I can tell you, as you have heard Ray sing, the anchor holds, that the anchor holds. The anchor held when I was a seminary student, a retired colonel with a life change that just almost brought me to my knees, to right now at this moment that I stand before you and I tell you, through many trials in some of the darkest valleys as a pastor, not only here, but in the other churches that I pastored, the anchor holds. When you lose a loved one, the anchor holds. When you lose your job, the anchor holds. When your spouse walks out on you and says, I don't want to be married anymore, the anchor holds. No matter what you are experiencing in life, and I can just imagine some of what you may be going through here. One of the things I've learned as a pastor behind that smile, there's a hurting heart on most people. There's a heart crying out, God, help. Help me or help my loved one. So I want us to, I want us to look at this passage of, in Joshua this morning because they were experiencing, they are experiencing much of what we're experiencing here, some of us. Some of us that are on that brink into a life change. Remember, several weeks ago I talked about a life change. And I, I, I illustrated it at the golf. Golf, for example, is a lot like the Christian life. Some of us are on the first hole. Some of you are on the getting ready to play the back nine. Some of you, like me, are playing my final hole and working my way up to the final putt on the 18th hole when it's over. And you remember I said, but in order to play, you got to have the right tools. You got to have the right clubs. You got to have the Bible. You got to have faith. You got to have trust. You got to believe in Jesus Christ. <laughs> and if you do, the anchor, again, the anchor, Jesus Christ, will hold. God prepares us, and some of those life changes, I'm not just talking about an, a crisis now, I'm talking about a life change. Again, when, when, when I left the military, and our family left the military after 28 year, and a half years, and came into the ministry, that was a life change. That, that, was, from, that was from an army, an armed force, that was disciplined, that was sold out, families, sold out for the gospel or, or for the nation, sacrificing, disciplined. You didn't have to ask them very often, more than twice. Into a society, into a ministry, into a civilian ministry. And sometimes you have to say, won't you join us? Won't you pick up your weapon? Won't you pick up your gift? Won't you go into that field that's ripe for harvest? And of course we know, and you know, that there are many, many Christians who bear that name Christian that are satisfied with where they are. And this is, these events, some of the events, life changes that you have experienced, they have knocked you to your knees. Some of you have not seen, uh, sensed or, or participated or experienced 
a major life change, the odds are it's going to knock you to your knees. And this is what is about to happen as we look at this passage of scripture from Joshua. Jesus had already told Joshua as the commander taking over from Moses, Moses, I will give you every place that you step. Every place where you plant your foot, it's yours. <coughs> Just leave my people across the Jordan River. And all was going well until they got up to the brink and they looked at the Jordan River. You see, it was flood season. And the Jordan River was a roaring, roaring river at that time. And in fact, it was overflowing in much of the land, much of the banks of the river. And so the people looked at this and they began to have some doubts. You see, they were a second generation because when God led his people out of Egypt across the Red Sea, they disobeyed him over and over again. Chance after chance, they disobeyed him until one day he said, none of you are going into the promised land. So I'm going to send up 12 spies to the promised land. And they did. Ten of them came back and said, it's impossible. They're too big. They're too this, they're too that. Two came back, Joshua and Caleb, and said, we can do this with the Lord. Wherever you are, whatever brink you are standing on this morning, my brothers and sisters in Christ, you can do this with the Lord. He is the good shepherd. He is the one who says, I will walk with you through that valley of the shadow of death. He will walk with you however deep your valley may be until he brings you to the other side. And so with that way of an introduction, I want us to take a look at um, Joshua chapter 3 here. And, uh, and listen, beginning in, in verse uh, 7, he said, The Lord said to Joshua, don't miss this. The Lord said to Joshua, Today I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. God promises, not just to the nation of Israel, not just to, to Joshua. God makes that promise throughout Scripture that wherever you go, I'm with you. When you become a Christian and the Holy Spirit comes into your life and it seals you, you cannot get away from God. You're his now. He bought you with his blood and his suffering. And what he wants to do is, for those who, who, who refuse to go over that brink to the to the life that he wants you to live. He will do those things lovingly to bring you to the point where you cry out to God. I understand now, Jesus. Forgive me. And he puts you back on that narrow road. And he takes you wherever you are in this life. He takes you from where you are to where you want, want, he wants you to be. You've heard me say that a thousand times. And I will say it as long as I preach. Thank God he has taken me from where I was, and he brought me here. But he's not finished with me yet. He's got another plane out there, and he does for you. Please let that sink into your heart. And then he says, go down to verse 14. He said, so when the people set out from their tents to pass over the Jordan with the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people, and as soon as those bearing the Ark had come as far as the Jordan, and the feet of the priests bearing the ark were dipped in the brink of the water. Now the Jordan overflows all its banks throughout the time of harvest. The waters coming down from above stood and rose up in the heap very far away at Adam, the city that is beside Zarathon, and those flowing down toward the Sea of the Arabah, the Salt Sea, were completely cut off. Sounds like Egypt, doesn't it? Sounds like when he brought them out of Egypt. And he destroyed the entire Egyptian army who was after his people. Verse 17, he said, Now the priest bearing the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firmly on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan. 
and all Israel was passing over on dry ground, <coughs> excuse me, until the nation finished passing over the Jordan. Father, speak to us your word, for it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I want to reiterate something <clears throat> to use kind of a metaphor. Every one of us, the truth is, is facing, has faced, or will face maybe an even more powerful Jordan River in the future. However you want to, defy, to define that, that Jordan River, the one that's flowing, the one that's loud, the one that is just, if you step into that water, even on the, on the brink of the water, it can just blow you away, carry you away. We're experiencing that. And not miss this. This is a great question that loomed over the camp of Israel and it looms over our lives as we stand or will stand on the brink of a God-sized future. Two questions. Do you believe? Did the nation of Israel believe? Do you believe that God can handle the impossible? Some believe that there's something going on in your life. Maybe it was the doctor said, that's it. There's nothing else I can do. And yet somebody prays for, for healing for you. And what's the thought of perhaps you or perhaps some who have heard that? Well, that's impossible. The doctor said, brothers and sisters in Christ, whatever you got going on in your life, it's God that has the last word. And he is a miracle-working God. Trust the Lord with all of your heart. I plead with you, trust the Lord with all of your heart and don't lean on what you see. Because often what you see and for sure what you hear today is either not true or God says, well, I'll show you what the truth is. So here's three cru crucial events that I want us to I just want to share with you this morning. I want you to look upon these that uh, when you're crossing over into the unknown, whatever that may be, maybe a new job, a new family, a new profession, new ministry, whatever, think about these. You know, Charles Kettering, who was a writer, said, we should all be concerned about the future because we have to spend the rest of our lives in the future. Are you concerned about your future? Crossing over to the future, to the unknown, there's three things we must do, I believe, we must do according to the Word of God. Number one, follow the movements of God. Follow God. Focus on Him because there are so many things in our life that wants to take us away, to divert our attention, divert our gaze. And you know what Satan's looking for? He's looking for you just like Peter did when Peter saw on that Sea of Galilee when another storm had come up, that very same Sea of Galilee where the Jordan River was flowing into it. And he saw Jesus out there in the boat. And when he saw it was Jesus, what did Peter do? He jumped out of the boat and he started walking on the water to Jesus. And then what happened? You know the story. He looked at that storm. He looked at those waves. He took his eyes off of Jesus. And what happened? Immediately, immediately he sank. <coughs> but you know what happened? The anchor held. The anchor grabbed a hold of Peter and put him in that boat. Why did he do that? Because just like God has a purpose for you, God had a purpose for Peter. And one of the purposes... One of the purposes was deny Jesus Christ three times. Well, I don't understand that, Ted. Well, I don't understand that either. But that's what happened. There are things that happen that I don't understand. I'm not the brightest bulb in the room. But God understands. Listen to me. God understands when you can't see anything but the waves and the roaring water, God understands. God can walk on water. God will never let you drown. 
Not if you're trusting him. Not if you're walking in his way. And I think this is what, what, what Joshua and, and the nation of Israel. You know, uh, the ark in, in the uh, monument of, of God's faith is a, a monument of God's faith to Israel. And, 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 but it's much more. In, in the Old Testament, in Emmanuel, Emmanuel, God with us. Emmanuel, God with you. God, God with you. God out in front of you. And our task is to follow him. Remember, Joshua, as he was getting ready to do this, he looked up there and he saw this, this man. And he walked up to him, and the man was dressed in, as a warrior. And he said, are you for me or against me? And he said, take off your shoes. I'm the commander of the Lord's army. You know what a commander does in, in the military? Commander is with his troops. He's not in the back. He's with his troops. He cries with his troops. When his troops are wounded, he holds them. He laughs with them. He feeds them the sustenance that they need. He gives them the weapons and makes sure that they are trained so they can defend themselves against an enemy that wants to kill them. Satan wants to kill you, members of the army of Jesus Christ. Satan wants to kill you. He wants to kill your preacher. He wants to kill your family. And when he can do that, he can bring the whole house down, so to speak. You see, this was serious business of what the nation of Israel was about to cross that Jordan River. And they were getting cold feet. When God says, I want you to get wet feet, when, when the priests step in that water, it's going to dry up. Just trust me. And there were those who would still say there's no human way to cross. My brothers and sisters in Christ, there is always a way to cross when Jesus Christ is leading you, no matter where he's leading you. He'll lead you through the hospital. He'll lead you through your job. He'll lead you through whatever it is that he calls you to do. But he said something very interesting to them, something that we have trouble, to, tr trouble with. When we're following the movements of God and we say there's no human way to access or to cross this river, wherever Jesus leads and we fix his eyes on him, you know what he says to us? Fix, my eye, fix your eyes on me and then do what? Go. Go. I love what Charles Stanley, the late Charles Stanley, said so often in his messages. I learned this from his grandfather, who taught him much theology and what he knew. And his grandfather said, if the Lord tells you to run full speed ahead against that wall, you run to that wall, and God is going to provide an opening for you. Brothers and sisters, Wherever you are today, God is going to provide an opening for you when you don't see or you can't comprehend. Look at a second thing um, that I think is important here. Consecrate yourself to experience God's plain future. Listen to what he said in verse 5 of the text. He said, Then Joshua said to the people, Consecrate yourselves. For tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Did you catch that? If you will concentrate, con um, consecrate yourselves, the Lord is going to do marvelous things tomorrow for you. There's a message there for us as well. That means to dedicate, to be holy, to set apart. God is telling his people, we will cross this raging river together if you consecrate yourselves. What does that mean? It means to repent. It means to give up anything 
that's in our life, anything that is holding us back. I want you to listen to something that, that Isaiah said in the Old Testament, in Isaiah chapter 59. Listen to what Isaiah said about consecration. In verse 1 he said, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, or his ear dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities, what's that? Your sins, your sins have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Why would you ever allow yourself to be in a situation where God is not hearing you? Or God is not responding to your prayer, especially today. If you're in that position, you're still standing on the brink of whatever and God is saying go. Or God is saying give. Or God is saying whatever to you. He's giving a command to you. As a mother or a father, as a Christian, and you want to pray for your child to be saved, you want to pray for your child to, uh, um, to have successful surgery, you want to pray that your husband, your child, your wife, whatever would live, and yet you're not being obedient to God. The Bible says that line of communication is cut off. You got on the wrong frequency. And so when you're on the wrong frequency, that communication is garbled or it's just totally, you don't hear anything. And God's saying, I want you to get on the right frequency because we've got a lot of stuff to do and a lot of things that I want to do with you and through you. So trust me, again, repent of every known sin. I want to read something to you that I was reading this morning. got up very early, as you can imagine, and, and I was reading My Utmost for His Eyes, to Oswald Chambers, and I thought, how appropriate. Listen to what he said. <clears throat> Never tolerate, because of sympathy for yourself or for others, any practice that is not in keeping with a holy God. Holiness means absolute purity of your walk before God. The words coming from your mouth and the very thought in your mind, placing every detail of your life under the scrutiny of God himself. That's what we have the opportunity to do. You know what I really think it means in today's uh, parlance, if you will? Get rid of all the junk that's taking up space and weight in your life. Some of us are carrying around junk and it's weighing us down. We can't take that step because we're afraid to take that step. We don't know, is this, God, is this really the step you want us to take? And that unconfessed sin, or that sin that God has forgiven you for years ago, years ago, you're holding on to it and it's weighing you down. When you step into that water, you're going to drown. God says, give it up. I've set you free. I'm God, my son Jesus Christ. Broke those chains. Give it up. Don't carry it away or carry it around. Get rid of all the junk. And, and friend, the Bible says that you and I are sanctuaries of the living God. The living God living in us, each one of us. So we don't need to be weighed down by sin that he's already forgiven us for. We don't have to be weighed down by gout, by doubt, and anger, and frustration, and anxiety. God says, give it to me. What do you fear? Someone once said, I wish I would have said it. Do the thing that you fear, and the death of fear is certain. Do the thing, step a, a, one step into that water, one step off that brink. And the death of fear will be over in your life. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will be there. There's something else, the third action here. Step out, stand still, and wait on the power of God. That's what he said. He said, I want you to go out there, step into that water, stand still, and wait on the power of God. 
Sometimes God wants us to do that because he's got to arrange certain things in other people's lives in order to get them to do for you what he wants to do for you. And sometimes it takes patience. I never pray for patience. I don't have to. It wouldn't do any good. We're an impatient society. You know, Americans are impatient. You know, you know what used to get a lot of soldiers killed, at least in Vietnam? Impatience. The enemy would hide himself very, very, very well. And flying as a scout pilot, we had to certain regulations that we maintain a certain altitude and a certain airspeed. But you know how smart the enemy was? The NVA, the Viet Cong? They knew that this American would not see anybody and slowly he would start slowing up. Slowly he would start slowing up. Slowly he would start violating the principles. And that's when they would come out of their holes and zap you. This is what Satan wants to do to you. That's why we've got to stay sharp. We've got to keep this armor on. You see, we're in a serious business. The ministry, people saving lives, it's serious. And you know, the, the thing is, we never know. My late wife was 69. Pat's late husband was 69. 47 years of marriage, 51 years of marriage. Pat's husband just had a great checkup, great physical. Been to church in the morning, getting ready to go to church in the afternoon, heart attack. Revived three times, three times by Pat. The fourth time, it was over. We never know. This isn't something to scare you. If I could scare you into receiving Christ and believing the Word of God, I'd do that. I'd do anything because I know now by experience that what I'm saying is true. I can pastor you and say I know what it is to lose a loved one. I know what it is to have a life change. I know what it is to say, you know those golden years that you hear about? They ain't so golden. In fact, they that river begins to flow at even greater speed, if you will. 19 miles up the river, of the Jordan River, beyond sight, those waters mounted up in a great heap, and those priests and the nation of Israel walked across that Jordan River that moments before they were fearing going in there, and God said, I'm not a God of fear. I'm a God of victory, and I'm a God of power. And you wait there until you see my power, and then you go. And that's exactly what happened to the nation of Israel. Let me give you very quickly here, very quickly, some decisive steps into your future. Number one, believe and live knowing nothing is too difficult for God. It's easy to believe that, but do you live that? It's easy for me to say that. But can I live that, and, and do I live that? Secondly, in faith, focus your entire being on Jesus Christ. Focus your entire being. That means not just your eyes, but your life on Jesus Christ. We have no idea what God has stored up for us when we're obedient, but you know what? God does. Jim Collins, in Good to Great, why some people make the leap and others don't. He said this, few attain great lives in part because it's just so easy to settle for the good life. I'm happy, I'm comfortable, I got everything I need. I don't want the great life. I'm comfortable. Just to let me alone, pastor. The good life. And then he said, between the good life and the great life rolls the mighty Jordan River the river of impossibility. And so many, he said, fail to cross. 
because they never took that first step. Christians. Thirdly, continuously repent of all sin and prepare now. Prepare right now. Praise team's going to come and they're going to lead us to the invitation before this almighty God. You don't know when God's coming for you. You don't know when he's coming. Prepare now. Are you prepared right now? I've got to confess, and some of you men, because I've seen this in the military as well, so, so has Mike. If I were to go today, I would be laying such angst upon my family, my daughter, my son, my wife, because they have no idea where anything is. They have no idea what my insurance policies are. Oh, they're in that file cabinet over there. Prepare right now because you don't know, and it's one of the things I'm going to do very, very quickly in the next few weeks. Continuously repent of all your sin and prepare now. You know what's on the other side of the Jordan River? Wasn't there yet, but you know what was going to be on the other side of the Jordan River? The cross of Jesus Christ. And that cross is for you, and that cross is for me. That cross is for you this morning. And the Bible says right now, Jesus Christ knows your heart. And the Bible says that right now, Jesus is praying for you to respond to him. Has, has he said something to you this morning that you need to respond to Jesus on? Then do it right now. We're going to bow our heads. Our praise team's going to come, and we're going to sing just a few verses. And then we're going to join hands, as is our custom here. We're going to pronounce a benediction, and you know what? We're going back out into this world. The world hasn't changed out there. I pray something has changed here. Would you pray with me? Oh, Lord, our Heavenly Father God, as we bow before you, Almighty God, Lord, we thank you that your word is living and it's active. It can penetrate any heart, the hardest heart that's here today. It can move mountains. Even with faith the size of a mustard seed, you say it can move a mountain. And Lord, there are some things that we may have in our lives that feel like a mountain, but they're not. Not when we place them in the hands of Almighty God. For those of us who are Christians, we also know that the Holy Spirit is taking right now the words that I'm speaking and, and he's putting them into real effect and giving them to you. So Father, I pray that for someone here today that, that needs to pray, that needs prayer for them, that needs to share, And God, I pray that they would just sit, just find somebody here today or come to the altar and pray or come and see me here at the altar and pray. Whatever it is, Father, prayer is powerful. Prayer changes lives from that road that leads to destruction to the road that leads to eternal life in heaven. And Father, if there's a heart here that has never asked Christ to come into their life, pray that right now they would just tell God right now because he sees the sincerity of your heart. If you're not sincere, don't tell God. But if you're sincere, ask Christ. Just, Jesus, save me. Save me from what I'm in, what I'm involved in. Save me. I've tried. I've tried every other thing, Lord, and I can't. I can't save myself. But Lord, because you see the sincerity in my heart, I thank you for what you have done. Didn't expect that today, Lord. But you're a God that does the unexpected. Father, there may be someone here today that's looking for a church home and 
Father, if you lead them in the power of the Holy Spirit, the direction of the Holy Spirit here to Pine Draw, then, then Father, we just praise you in advance for what you're about to do. God, this is your time. This is your day. This is, the, this is your invitation. Oh, Lord, let us not reject your invitation, whatever it is that you've laid upon our hearts. And we pray and ask these things in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. Would you stand as our praise team leads us our invitation? We're going to do just two or three verses, so, so don't drag your feet. Don't allow Satan to keep you there in that chair. Share. Sure. 